you've done a lot of papers and patents on um, understanding social issues through social media data. So um, there are papers that we'll include in the show notes related to um, the effects of early college alcohol use. Um, and and you, you pull out patterns in social media uh, data related to this alcohol use. Um, uh, the, the influence of social pressures on daily activity patterns. Um, and you pull this out of rhythms in Twitter data. Um, and you've also done research um, on the flu and separately mental health, um, also using social media data to um, come up with uh, some of the conclusions that you draw in that research. So uh, I am curious about this, this body of research that you seem fascinated with, this use of social media data. So what motivated you to get involved in using those data? And is it related to causal inference in some way? Yeah, it, it, it is in, 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 in many ways. I, I got into, so I've changed you know, research interests a few times uh, in my career. I used to be a distributed systems researcher. Um, I'll skip over how, but I got into social computing and, and then computational social science, really just being fascinated by what, how much information about, you know, uh, people and important problems that, that, you know, people and societies faced uh, was embedded in, in social media data and other digital traces. And so, um, um, I got into the computational social science uh, community and started seeing all these fascinating questions that people were asking, all motivated by you know wanting to solve problems to get real insights that would help us with you know um, uh, online mental health issues, with health issues. The, the flu example is um, a study where social data had only a, a relatively s- small part to, to play, but we were looking at how, uh, seasonal influ- influenza spreads uh, across the U.S. every year. Why does it start where it starts? And mm-hmm. then why does it travel the way it does? Is it airplanes? Mm-hmm. Is it local travel? Is it weather? Like what uh, What plays the part? And we yeah, were able those, to read that, uh, that word why. <laughs> <laughs> the word why, exactly. <laughs> it seems that's a recurring one of these causal inference episodes as well as in your Pi Why and Do Why episodes. Yes. So yeah. Uh, and then when, when I go to a lot of these conferences, People would be, you know, asking these great questions. They they have this great story about what they were seeing. Why are people making friends? Why are um, you know ha- what's driving people's behaviors? Why I, I like that. Too. This is, yeah. I like the idea of the, like at a computer science conference. Why are people making friends? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're tying, t- tying this back to, to you know theories about like triangle closure and stuff like that from I don't know how many like decades ago um, in the social sciences. But anyway, then they end their presentation on this really uh, deflated note. Of course, all of our analyses are correlational. Mm. Who knows what's really driving these patterns? We don't know. Right. And it's like, well... That sucks. Like you've got this great, huge data set, great insights into what's driving. You've talked to the domain experts, like you've got all of this knowledge coming together. And then because correlation is not causation, you just have to have this huge caveat at the end that says, you know, but who knows? And, and that was really disappointing. And I'd heard about, I mean, it was presentation after presentation. I remember this one day when it was just every presentation. Um, had to have this caveat. And um, I'd heard about this area called causal inference, that there were ways of pulling causal, uh, um, uh, making causal inferences from observational data. And so that's the day I think I decided that I needed to go learn more about that and bring it to uh, the the communities that I was a part of then. Cool. Um, And so that... That triggered a, a, a line of work um, where we were demonstrating the use of these methods to analyze signals that we were pulling out of social media data. The first one was on uh, the, ev- uh, I'm going to mess up the title exactly, but basically the, ev- the events that seem to lead to suicidal ideation in, um, in social media forums. And we were able to make causal connections between issues that people 
talked about occurring in their lives and then later on see them talking about uh, suicidal ideation. Um, and we not only did the causal analysis over the data, we also uh, worked with domain experts to uh, tie this back to theories of suicidal ideation um, offline and basically show that the same issues and, and signals that were dominant that are were believed to exist offline are also showing up online. And that was an important and interesting topic to, to study, um, partially because of the limits of, of studying suicidal ideation offline. You, you can't talk to everybody, unfortunately, about, about what triggered uh, uh, their issues. Mm -hmm. And so that was the beginning. And there was a, a, a thread of work with a close collaborator, uh, Moon Moon the Churhuri at uh, Georgia Tech uh, faculty there, uh, where we uh, continued looking at um, mental health issues uh, online with uh, causal methods. And that's her whole research area. So like, she's the person to talk to if, if your listeners are more interested in that. The... Um, um, but and then I and then I went and, and wanted to you know broaden the use of these methods and so worked with other domain experts and other topics etc and then eventually the causal methods themselves the toolkit the algorithms became more of my primary research focus uh, more than the computational social science questions so I still care about them I still care about like the societal implications of AI but it's um, um, for now, my most more of my time is going to the the uh, causal machine learning itself. Nice. So you, from studying these kinds of social issues, going to these social conferences, and being frustrated by people constantly drawing conclusions where they had to couch those conclusions and say, "We found this strong correlation, but we can't be one hundred percent sure about causal direction." Um, that led you to start examining causal inference techniques a fair bit. And then now that has really taken your interest and your focus primarily on causal inference uh, as opposed to necessarily that specific application of, of the social space, though you still have an interest in it. Um, yeah. That's cool. Mm -hmm. um, so you've had this exciting journey now. You talked about it a bit there. Uh, so while on the one hand, you've been in one job <laughs> for over 17 years, I think your entire post PhD career yeah. you've been at Microsoft Research. And so uh, on the one hand, it sounds like <laughs> there hasn't been that much excitement and change, but on the other hand, there has been enormous excitement and change, not only in Microsoft, the company, uh, but also in your research interests at Microsoft Research. So uh, you mentioned being in distributed systems uh, and then there's fault detection in large scale systems and these uh, these social uh, questions that you were tackling, and now this focus on causal inference. So that is an exciting journey. Um, what's next for you? Do you have uh, insight into that? Maybe some um, particular research direction within causal machine learning? Yeah, I think so. The um, um, I think I'm I'm going to be in causal machine learning in, uh, for for a, a while yet. I don't see that uh, uh, going away soon until AGI. But <laughs> but um, the uh, I think what I'm excited about is seeing these um, these methods like get broader use. I really think that they are going to have a strong impact on you know the value of our decision making. Um, and so, um, if I had to pick like application areas where um, I think I'm most excited about partnerships we have, right. um, the things that I've been excited about are. Um, um, I think we have uh, we're seeing a broader pickup in uh, industrial usage, uh, like industries uh, using this. Um, one that's a lot of fun these days is is actually agriculture. Um, uh, we have a, a partnership with um, uh, the Global Soil Health Program, whose mission is to improve uh, soil management methods uh, by of I think over sixty percent of the world's farmers to make the soil healthier through better sequestration of carbon and also um and also improve the uh you know carbon sequestration for uh mitigating uh climate change the challenge here is that um uh the carbon process in soil is not uh super well understood huh. uh, it's very complex there are models of it that 
work in particular regions, but there isn't a global understanding of the carbon process that, is, that works across the world. And of course, if you're trying to reach 60% of the world's farmers, they need that, that global model. So we're working with them to try to apply causal models, not only to learn from observational data, but also to help direct the gathering of data um, and uh, experimentation. So it's really a kind of uh, a broad approach to helping make sure that we can, we can uh, better understand uh, how carbon stays in the soil. Cool. I'm playing a supporting role in that as like the machine learning person. I'm not the soil person, right? But it, that's certainly been a lot of fun. Um, on um, and then others, I think other fun areas, impactful areas are are health. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done in, in improving health and using uh, causal methods to augment the current uh, randomized control trial based, uh, you know, right. uh, development process for uh, treatments. Um, and and one that's that's been been uh, great actually as an accelerator of research is a partnership with um, our online services. In particular, our um, um, I do a lot of work with this great team and it, at uh, at our uh, in Microsoft Advertising. Um, they have very crisp problem statements, infrastructure, data, and ability to run experiments to validate that our methods are doing the right thing but then also a strong desire to avoid um, uh, experiments that you know, are expensive, uh, frankly. So um, that's actually been a way for us to develop new algorithms that we think are gonna be broadly applicable, but then also make sure that they are correct. Sounds really cool. The, uh, the agricultural applications sound particularly fascinating to me. Um, we've had other episodes on the show that deal with um, agriculture. Um, so for example, Serge Massis, who is actually the researcher uh, for this program now. Uh, so in recent months, he's been doing uh, an amazing job of researching guests like you uh, before you come on air and comes up with amazing questions for me to ask and provides me with a lot of context um, that he digs up from your papers, patents, talks you've given. Um, and so Serge is an invaluable a contributor to the Super, Super Data Science Podcast. But before he was doing any of that, he was a guest on the show in episode number 539. And he was um, specifically talking about agricultural data science mm -hmm. um, and climate health, that kind of thing. So uh, I can't wait for him to listen to this episode um, and hear about how uh, causal methods could be uh, impacting the work that he's doing. Um, and then, of course, climate change. Um, you know, so related to that, this idea of um, carbon sequestration and taking advantage of how we're managing soil to be um, fixing carbon from the atmosphere and having a, um, a positive impact on climate change. And so if listeners are interested in an episode specific to climate change, if that's something that interests you, um, I highly recommend episode number 459 with Vince Pataccio, where he reviews um, the literature um, and a broad, uh, broad range of applications related to using machine learning in uh, mm -hmm. combating climate change. So yeah, it sounds really fascinating. Great to hear um, all these uh, applications of causal machine learning from you. And no doubt uh, there will be many more to emerge in the future, especially um, as we figure out how to be applying causal methods to unstructured audio and video, which um, is a huge, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of data, uh, exponentially more data available there than in, than in structured data sets. Um, something we haven't talked about on the show, at least explicitly, maybe, um, maybe you're aware of applications kind of, as you were discussing some of these applications, maybe implicitly you're aware, um, of, uh, natural language processing uh, data, natural language data. Is that something that we see? Um, so we've talked about how, you know, structured tabular data, that's the, the sweet spot for, for causal methods today, including causal, including causal machine learning methods. Uh, how unstructured audio and video uh, don't work that well. But what about unstructured text? Text and audio and video are, are in the same bucket um, the, um, from the causal perspective. But right. the, the way that we're approaching them, um, I think we started a, as a, you know, the academic community a couple of years ago started applying um, invariance discovery, uh, which has a causal interpretation. 
so it's basically we're not going to rely on patterns that we see shifting across a couple of sample data sets. Um, we'll only, and so even if a pattern looks really strong and great um, and explains like 90%, 95% of what we care about, the fact that it's varying from 90 to 95 and we don't know why means that we don't really know that maybe one day it wouldn't drop down to zero, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we prefer to find the like the 70% correlations that are just consistent, right, and not changing. Um, uh, build now that 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 kind of uh, direction is has uh, built out quite a bit, and now we're at a place where we can look at a causal graph, read off the um, statistical independencies that are implied by that graph, and um, and impose them uh, within your uh, your deep learning model to ensure that you're looking at patterns that are consistent with the causal graph uh, for a particular target that you're trying to predict, et cetera. And so I think that this, this line of work is very promising. It's going to continue. Uh, 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 it, I think that's going to continue and give us ways of applying um, these causal methods to um, uh, unstructured data.